sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, <clears throat> Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be showed mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you falsely, and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So be it. I can see that. Thank you. Children's Church. <laughs> so if you don't realize it, if you need to be reminded, if we need that nudging, we are called to be different. We are called to be changed. Till all of me is gone and nothing remains except Christ living through me. That's the reason that Jesus ask the Father to send back His Holy Spirit because we have a ministry here on earth. If we're saved, we should know it and our life should surely show it. Father in heaven, we thank You so much for Your Word. We thank You that Jesus, who was God, did not consider equality with God to be something to be used for His advantage, but instead humbled Himself and gave up everything, including His life, to save others. Father, we pray that we believe this and that it forever changes us. We know that it's a process by which we're sanctified, but we're justified right off. We're, we're set right in your eyes because of what we believe that Christ Jesus has done for us. So we pray, Lord, that by your word, by your spirit, that you sanctify us through and through so that we will live a life that brings glory and honor to you. We thank you for the privilege to come here and worship you, study your word, Lord. Help us to apply it to our lives, to make a difference, Father. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And if you didn't understand, Molly is the name of the man in the movie who became a multimillionaire but saw the poverty going on in his own country, the slavery, everything else, saw people without food and everything, said, I can't live this way. Maybe he read that story about the young rich ruler and maybe it scared him because he wasn't willing to do that. Maybe he read that passage about the, the rich man who was a fool who stored up his own things in heaven. Maybe he just read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whatever it was, it changed him. It made him different. Where he realized that the reason that he had the things that he had, even the oxygen that he breathed, was because God gave it to him and he needed to be different. He needed to be changed. So this message is called Faithfully Living. Last week you got an invitation. said you're going to a banquet if you believe. There's a celebration. We looked at those parables and we saw that, that the reason for this celebration was there was something lost that has now been found and that was each and every individual because God created them to be in a relationship with Him. 
to worship Him because He loved them, not because He needed them, not because He needs you, but because He wants a relationship with you. And when that lost thing was found, especially the lost son there, had to be rejoicing because God Almighty, the Father of all, is rejoicing when one soul comes back to Him. So I want to start today with talking about the reason John wrote his gospel again. I'm going to say it and say it and say it probably till I'm out of breath. But it's so that you might believe. So the thing is, is do you believe that? Not just believe I'm a Christian, not believe I'm saved, not believe that Jesus is God's son. Jacob was clear about that. Demonic faith believes. Demonic faith. And they fear and tremble. The waves obey. Nature obeys. Do you obey? Because see, you can't believe and not strive to obey. As a matter of fact, you're fighting against the very spirit that's inside of you that's the only reason that you are a child of God and the only reason that you can worship God because you have to worship Him in spirit and in truth. All it takes is childlike faith to come to Him but you're never to remain in childish faith. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have your life straightened out. You just need to believe and come to Him. There's no restrictions, no one better, no one different. All men are called by Jesus to come to Him. The difference in mankind versus animals and plants and everything is we have a choice whether we're going to worship God or not. And with that choice comes responsibility. With that choice, if you make the right, wrong choice, it says that there's eternal punishment. Don't let anyone tell you that that's not true. That a loving God couldn't send anyone to hell. A loving God has to send those who are disobedient to hell. We read His Word, we understand that. We don't have to make up things in our mind to, to rationalize God. God is God. He is sovereign. He is in control of every molecule, everything. You and I don't understand it. We don't understand cancer. Come on, we don't understand that. We live in a fallen world and we don't want cancer to affect us or affect a loved one. But guess what? We live in a fallen world. And one day Jesus will return and all of those things will go away. There will be no more sickness, no more pain. Because God is perfect and holy and just. And because He is, He is loving, merciful, kind. And it's not His will that anyone should perish. So all you have to do is believe. And if you believe, you will be changed. You can't stay the same if you believe. When you believe you are justified, that means you are counted righteous in God's eyes because you carry the righteousness of Jesus because He lived a perfect, sinless life. And you believed in Him. His sacrifice was complete. He said it was finished. He also said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then He returned and said, I'm going to send back the Spirit. you are still got a mission, guys. You're to carry on the message of the Old Testament again also, to train up your children, to tell others. Oh, in these foreign heathen lands in the Old Testament, they had a chance still to see the power and glory of this God of the Israelites and repent. But if they didn't repent, then God wiped out man, woman, and child. And you don't have to rationalize that. You don't have to have an age to come up with anything else. You simply say that God is sovereign in control. He's just and right and perfect. I don't have to have all the answers, but I see that God will judge and punish sin. And with believing becomes obedience to what God commands. That's why we have the law in the first place. And Paul said, if it weren't for the law, I would have never realized how wretched I was. And what a hopeless condition that I am in. But praise be to God that because of His Spirit that I can now live a life in obedience to the law. I still struggle, I still fall short, but as I die to myself and live through Christ, the more and more that I will become like Christ to the point where I am taken into heaven and I will be like Christ. 
There won't be sin temptations in anything then. It will be as far into me as, like I said before, going out and taking a car tire off or anything else you want to and just start gnawing on it. I have no desire to do that. I don't even have a desire to change a tire, let alone eat a tire, because it's foreign to me. And that's what sin will be when we get to heaven. We won't think a thing about it. So why are we not progressing for that today? God is completely sovereign. Oh, but what about the devil? The devil made me do it, right? Well, the devil doesn't make you do anything. He planted seeds of discord in the first human beings. And because they wanted to be like God, read the scriptures, they decided to disobey God. He had no power over them. And Jesus is clear in John 12. He said that he is stripping Satan of his authority and power. The only authority that Satan has is what God allows him. Does that make God evil? No, it makes God give you a choice again whether you're going to choose evil or good. Amen. The only reason that Satan is doing what he's doing now is because he had pride and wanted to be like God. And God has given him authority for a season and that authority has been limited, taken away by the cross because of what Jesus did. <laughs> we know the end of the story. We know the outcome. I don't have all the answers. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have the answers about angels or anything else. But as you're reading scripture, you will see that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. It's clear that that is the case. That Jesus will return he will bring judgment for those who oppose him who do not believe in his name. He will bring rewards to others and eternal life. So what does God say? We'll just do a brief summary. In the Old Testament, oh, wait a minute, Old Testament God, isn't that a different God than the New Testament? No. It's a God who shows us he is just. He will punish but it is also a God that shows over and over and over again, even to his disobedient children, that he loves them and will provide for them. But he also punishes them. What loving father would not to protect his child? We've got a lot of children in here today. You don't like punishing them, but you certainly will to protect them, to correct their behavior. If you will do that out of the righteousness that you have in your heart, then why do you ever wonder what God does? And then at just the right time, He sent His Son to save you from your sins. And what did Jesus teach? He said, come, come, forsake everything else. Don't let it hinder you. Come and follow Me. And I will make you fishers of men instead of whatever else you're fishing for in this life. God will not tolerate disobedience. And you should be grateful for that. Because then we can realize how perfect heaven will be. And how you should realize that you have the keys of the kingdom of heaven now to tell others. That you have a right and a privilege to let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You are walking your life or not walking it as the hands and feet of Jesus on this earth. So what's Jesus like? You need to read, you need to study and see that He wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't weak. He was strong. He did teach righteousness but he also te taught mercy and grace. That he gave up his life. He gave up his equality with God. He humbled himself before the cross to save others without condemnation for those who spit in his face and mocked him. Those who whipped him and slapped a crown of thorns on his head. He did not judge them. But there will be a day when he will we're living in a season of grace. Are we telling others about that grace of God? The New Testament tells exactly the same thing as the Old Testament. God is sovereign. God is just. God is loving and kind. And there will be come a day when He restores back His righteousness and that means He has to do away with all evil. 
And all you and I have to do is believe. And if we believe, we'll forever be changed. So are you God's obedient child? If you believe, the power of God resides in you so that you can be His obedient child. It's not you that even has to do that. You just have to remember to die to yourself so that you can live. There are eternal consequences and you've been given an invitation to the banquet. What are you going to do with that invitation? James 2.5 reads this way in the New Living Translation. Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Does that mean I have to sell everything? Do I have to do like Molly did? No. But you have to do whatever God calls you to do with the riches He gave you. I don't know what He's calling you to do. But I know that if you have riches, there are people that don't. The one thing that you're truly rich in is in your faith and your salvation. So that's what you should be sharing more than anything else. But if you also look at Jesus' life, He built relationships up with the poor the marginalized in this world, the sick, the blind, the least of these, to let them know that God loves them also. That it's that not their fault that they're suffering and dying in this world. It's because of sin and He wants to correct all that. And He loves each and every one. And sometimes our righteousness gets in the way, doesn't it? Woe to you Pharisees and hypocrites, you vipers. Repent. And keep doing works that show your repentance. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will what? Inherit the kingdom that He promised to those who love Him. Doesn't matter who you are, it matters who you love. If you believe in Jesus, then you will love Him. You will adore Him for what He gave up to save you. So tell me what you think. I'll give you a few examples. If you see a man sitting on the sidewalk who's poor, dirty, hungry, the least of these, then you see an individual come up to him and say, get off your butt and get a job. What are your thoughts? Okay, let's take the same individual. Another individual comes up to him and says, God bless you. Have a nice day. Still another individual comes up and said, God loves you. Can I pray with you? And then goes on his way. What are your thoughts so far? What about still another person that comes up and says, can I get you something to eat? Is there some way that I can help you? That person might be saved, might not be saved either, right? There are compassionate people out there who are going to hell. Good people every day die and go to hell because they don't know Jesus Christ. Jesus is clear about that. He says to those who do mighty works in His name trying to justify what they've done, we've done this, we've done that. We've even cast out demons in your name. In your name, there's the key. By the power of God, not because they were saved. Jesus says, depart from me, I do not know you. I'm not intimate with you. I don't have a relationship with you. You did what was good, noble, but you still have sin and you still have to be punished. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. None are righteous, no, not one. So any of those people could be saved, could know Jesus, but I guarantee you to that person and to those who were watching, the person who did something for the least of these was the one that you'd be least likely to judge. Now, see, God knows the motives of the heart. Scripture's clear. So He knows exactly where judgment falls. But even you in your limited knowledge know the person that helped that person was the person who did more right. Now, if you know that you're saved, if you believe in Jesus Christ, how should you live your life? Another example might be to go, hey, can I do something to help you? Do you need something to eat? You take them to eat. Then you talk about why you did that. Because God has blessed you and you're rich in this world. 
and you care, you have compassion because Jesus loved you. God loved you enough that He would send His Son to die for you. And then you've planted the seeds. And that's what we're called to do. How do you live your life if you say you believe? Jesus said that He was God, did He not? And He said that He would lay down His life for His sheep. And He said His sheep know His voice and follow after Him. He also said that He would return and separate the sheep from the goats. No matter whether a goat thinks it's a sheep or not, it's a goat and it's a sheep. It's black and white. Jesus also says that those who aren't with me are against me. And those who are not scattering and gathering, or scattering seeds, and say that right, are scattering souls and not gathering. They're not planting the seeds. Matthew 5, where we read from earlier, verses 17 to 19, says, Don't misunderstand why I have come. These are Jesus' words. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses. Everything that you've read in the Old Testament points to me. Or the, the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. He died so that we could have the power to live as one that follows His commands. Before we did not. The Old Testament saints had to make sacrifices. They had to rely on a priest, God coming to the tabernacle and everything. We are a group of holy priests. That means that we carry God to others because Jesus Christ lives in us by the power of the Spirit. We are the messengers. We're the ones to proclaim the gospel message or not with how we live and how we say Verse 18 of Matthew 5 says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, (laughs) they will, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. Verse 19, so, listen up, those who have ears, let them hear. If you ignore the least command and teach others to do the same by what you're doing, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who what? Obeys God's law and teaches them by what they not only say, but why what you do. You try to teach somebody and do something different. They will label you for exactly what you are, a hypocrite and a liar. But those, anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I don't know about you, but that choice is pretty simple to me. And I know I can't do it, so I have to die so that God will do it through me. Because there's no way I can do it. There's no way I can get this love your enemy thing. But the more that I read God's Word, the more I rely on on the Spirit, the more that I see the Spirit reveal to me what Christ did for me, the more that I can't not love my enemy because God loved me as His enemy. I deserve the exact opposite of mercy and grace, but He freely offered it to me if I would simply believe. Jesus said, don't misunderstand why I have come. You have a choice. And your choice isn't just a statement, not just a head belief. It's a head belief that changes your heart, that motivates you to action. All you need is that childlike faith and you'll come to Him knowing that He is God, that He will do all things, that He loves me, that I don't have to figure all these things out. I just need to follow His voice. And if you are His sheep, you will follow His voice. But you're not supposed to stay childish faith, are you? We're studying 1 Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3, which we've got past that. We're up to chapter 12 now. But in 1 Corinthians 3, as a reminder, it says this in the first three verses. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. 
I had to talk as though you belonged to this world. So nothing's changed, right? They're still behaving that way. Or as though you were infants. Okay, now those, those are saved. They're, they're, they're saved. They're, they're eating spiritual food, but they're eating milk still. Shouldn't a child grow? I, if you remember when I did a little diaper thing and Sherry came up here, do you remember that vivid in your mind? Don't let you forget that because that should have forever changed you when she started putting me in a diaper and giving me a bottle. It's ridiculous to see an adult sucking on a bottle. But Jesus is saying in Scripture, and Paul is saying it here, that grow up. Don't keep sucking on that baby bottle. You're saved so you can grow up that you can be sanctified. It is God's will that you be sanctified through and through. Paul says, I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in the Christian life. It's a process of growing and maturing. As long as you have breath in your lungs, you're to grow to be more like Christ, the one we fix and set our eyes on, the author and perfecter of our faith. Verse 2, I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. Okay, now they're ready, right? Nope. And you still aren't ready. How sad. Paul started this church. He's now writing letters because there's divisions, because they can't get along, because they play favoritisms, all these things that, that we see in the early church and we still see today. That instead of putting Jesus on the throne we continue to say He's on the throne and argue with one another because we're trying to be on the throne. Verse 3, For you are still controlled by your sinful nature. Saved or not, you're still letting Satan have dominion and power over you that you shouldn't, that he does not have, not shouldn't, that he does not have if you are a child of God. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove that you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? Physical children grow up. It's, we see it. We see it in our physical realities. Why would you not, as a spiritual child of God, grow up to maturity till He takes you home? Go back to those examples. Think about them. Add on that fifth example that I told you. What if somebody went up, fed the man, took him to get some clothes, asked him if he had a roof over his head, and then told them about Jesus? You think it'd make a difference in his life? Maybe, maybe not. But what are you called to do? That's exactly what you are called to do. And going back to the parable of the, the rich, foolish man, whichever one you want to take, but I'm using the one that built bigger barns, it's ironic, no it's not, that God gave him grain to feed people and instead he built up bigger storehouses for himself. A perishable product that he could feed others that needed it, but he said, I'll just build it up for myself. What if I need it one day? God gives you everything. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Manna from heaven so that you would rely on Him daily for your needs. If you took any more than that, it would spoil. So you have been given abundance, especially in Christ Jesus, to tell the world of how much God loves them. There's a, little, there's a story in the New Testament that kind of reminds you about what God can do with food. Remember the little boy with five loaves and two fish? Yeah? and fed 5,000 men plus women and children that day? You know, it was something because Jesus knew what He did, was going to do already. And He told Philip, and Philip's like, ah, we don't have enough money. And He told Andrew, which Andrew, he's always bringing people to Jesus. Andrew went and got this little boy. But what a small, meager, insignificant offering. Oh, there's the woman with the two mites. There's all these stories. He gave all that He had and God used it. It might not seem like much, but He gave everything He had, and God used it to bring glory and honor to Him. 
John 6 records in verse 5 and 6 that Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Back to Jonah, back to any of our examples. God knows what He's going to do, and He's going to use even your disobedience because He is sovereign completely. He's going to use it to draw people to Him, just like Jesus said in John 12, that He will draw all people to Him. But isn't it so much better if you give Him your offering and watch what He does with it? rather than have, him have to watch Him use your disobedience to show that He's a sovereign God? How sad. Jesus had compassion. He loved people. And God has given you the things of this world so that you can be rich to others. That story of the rich man is from Luke chapter 12, verses 16 to 20, I'm going to read. He said, Then He told them this story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, What should I do? <laughs> what should I do? What should I do when I walk past that man? I don't have room for all my crops. I have such an abundance. Then he said, I know. Whoa, there's a mistake, isn't it? I know. What about what God wants me to do with the life He gave me back? I was headed for eternal damnation and He gave me abundant life instead. Here's what this man said, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods too. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, what did we say last week about those who Jesus called His friends? Those who did His will, those who He wanted to celebrate what was lost and now found. My friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Isn't that what life's all about? Eat, drink, and be merry. Oh, then there's a but in there. <laughs> but who? God said to him, You fool. You will die this very night. Then you will get everything that you worked for. Maybe you didn't catch it earlier when I said it, but the wages, what you've worked for with your life, with your thinking, is eternal death. The wages of sin is eternal death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Is God on the throne? Do you believe? Are you using what He's given you to glorify others? Jesus' ministry involved taking care of others who were less fortunate. He taught His disciples this. The world watched this. He fed them first. Then He told them that He could give them eternal life. He cured them first. Then He told them He could forgive sins. He let them know that He cared. Then He said, I am God. The choice is up to you whether you believe it or not. Paul says this in Romans 12, 20. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their head. They won't understand what you're doing, but you'll be speaking the love of God through your actions. You will be being obedient. You won't be a fool or a hypocrite. In 1 Corinthians 11, 20 and 21... Remember, Paul's talking to this church who has got divisions all among their body, pointing out who has more and who has less and can't get along at all in worship. He says, when you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you, are hung, or it, some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. <laughs> During their time when they came together as church, as a result, some go hungry. How can we not see that? And not only that, while others get drunk. The things that God has given you are not to indulge yourself and get drunk off of. Instead, get drunk with the Spirit is what Scripture says. To give, to not let someone be in need. 
Back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Don't misunderstand why I have come. I have come to bring salvation, yes, but I've also came to teach you how to live the abundant life which I've called you to live. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writing of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. The first verse I read was from James chapter 2, verse 5. And James is a book that when you read it, you're like, wow, it's just all right here about Christian action in work. You know, so much that Martin Luther didn't even want to accept it as the Word of God because he thought James was trying to say that you've got to have works. James was trying to say you've got to have works. Not for justification, but if you are justified, you have got to have works. You can't say that you are one thing and not live it. Of which Martin Luther came back and realized that. James 2.5 is what I read earlier. I want to read you before and after that. In verse 4 it says, Doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom He promised to those who love Him? But you dishonor the poor. Are you better than those that Jesus came to die for? Those that He physically healed? Those that He called to come and follow Him? Matthew 5.18 says, I tell you the truth until heaven and earth disappears. Not the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose has been achieved. God is drawing men to Himself till He makes all things right. Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago to forgive, to seek and save the lost, to change those forever by giving them His Spirit, those who would choose to believe in Him. And He will return and bring judgment or bring rewards and eternal life. That's what God's Word is clear to say. The Old Testament proves that God will bring judgment, but also proves that He's merciful and loving and kind. And that's the only kind of God that we would want to accept. A God that can't change, a God that is completely just, as well as completely loving and merciful. Not all that are sheep are sheep. Some are goats, and they will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is waiting till all of His sheep are safely in His fold before He returns. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 2-14 through 14 read this way, I want you to remember what the holy prophets said long ago, and what our Lord and Savior commanded. Same things, you've read them in the Old Testament, now Jesus has said them. And you've got that through, our, through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of, your of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens by the word of His command. And He brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then He used the water to destroy the ancient world. See all these things coming together? With a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. These are facts. They are being kept for when? The day of judgment. The day when you will be separated as a sheep and have eternal life or the day you'll be separated as a goat and be separated to eternal hell. When ungodly people will be destroyed. But, oh, there's hope here, good. You must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years of the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about His promises, some people think. No, He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. 
But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief, then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear with fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. But not if you're justified and made right because you believe in Jesus Christ and His sacrifice. But if you do believe that, does your life show it? Verse 12, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along by, by telling others, by inviting them in, by giving them their invitation to this banquet. On that day He will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and new earth that He has promised. A world filled with God's righteousness, a perfect place for all eternity. And so, dear friends, as a result of this, while you are waiting for these things to happen, let me clarify it this way, while you still have breath in your lungs, make every effort to be found living peacefully, peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in His sight. Matthew 5 verse 19 said, So, if you ignore the least command... Like love your enemies. Like if your enemy asks you for your coat, give him your shirt also. Like those that humble themselves. Those that deny themselves, take up their cross and follow after me. If you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That chapter goes on in verse 20 to say, but I warn you. So we even get a warning after all that. It should have been pretty clear here, but we get a warning. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, the ones who claim to be righteous, the ones who claim to keep the law, the ones who claim to be in right standing with God, but still neglected the poor, didn't they, and the marginalized? They even made the laws where they, they could be the only ones that could keep them and understand them. Instead of freely giving all that they had been given, they tried to hold some back so that they could be better than when Jesus was clear about becoming least. Unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness, which we have no righteousness, none are righteous, no, not one. But unless yours is better than the teachers of the religious laws and the Pharisees, you will never, ever, ever, ever enter the kingdom of heaven. Don't be fooled. Don't mock God. Verse 21, You have heard that our ancestors were told, You must not murder... If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. I haven't murdered anyone. Have you? Oh, let's read the next verse. But I, Jesus, who is God, says, if you're even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. You have broke the law. He didn't come to get rid of the law. He came to explain to you through the power of the Spirit by believing in His name what the law truly meant. That all are sinners, but all are saved by grace, by faith in Jesus Christ. And if you believe, you will be changed. You will be different. And the more that you grow and become like Christ, the more that none of me will remain. So do you believe this? My prayer today is that you die so that Christ can live through you to save your children, your families, your friends, to hurry in the day when Jesus returns because we've helped guide other sheep into the fold. And then we will spend eternity with God as brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. So do you believe? If so, are you living like you believe? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for Jesus' words, and not only his words, but his life. That he would give up heaven to save a wretched person like me and like everyone in here. 
that He is no respecter of persons, that He offers grace freely to all who will believe. It is by grace that we have been saved and we thank You and praise You for it. Lord, prick our hearts through Your Spirit to be more and more like Christ, to see the urgency of our calling, to see the things that we've been given to give and bring life and light to others, not to hide our light, not to store up treasures for ourselves, but to be rich towards You, O God, because You've been given that you have been given riches to us so abundantly. We thank You and praise You. We bring, just pray that we bring glory and honor to You through our lives individually and as this church. We thank You for our freedom to worship You. We thank You for the laughter of these children that are coming into Your midst. And we give You all praise and glory and honor through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.